So, yes, I'm Debbie Slavo with the American Cancer Society. I'm very pleased to be invited to present to you today. And I'm going to be using a set of slides uh, from the CDC You Are the Key uh, campaign. And uh, CDC has many versions of different lengths and for different audiences of, uh, of these presentations. And you can uh, make requests to CDC if, if you'll be giving a presentation and would like to, to use them. And the objectives have already been uh, uh, discussed or, or presented. And also, I do not have any uh, financial disclosures or disclosures of any kind. So I'm going to start with some basics. Uh, HPV infection and disease, and the burden of disease. 79 million Americans are currently infected with at least one type of HPV today. 14 million new infections occur every year in the U.S. So to me, these numbers are mind-boggling. And most of those infections are in people who are men, women, girls, boys in their teens and early 20s. Fortunately, most people will never know that they've been infected, but every year about 27,000 men and women will be diagnosed with an HPV-related cancer. In females, the most common HPV cancer is cancer of the cervix, and in males, it's oropharynx, which is the throat and base of the tongue. In addition to those 27,000 cases, this slide just deals with cervical, um, but there are uh, other lesions, uh, precancerous lesions, for example, of the anus, that this would also hold true for. So for cervical cancer, as many of you probably know, most women in this country do get screened. And screening detects many cases of precancerous changes in the cervix that are advanced enough to progress to cancer if not detected and treated. And because of this screening, we have hundreds of thousands of cases of advanced precancer that are detected and treated. Uh, that involves screening, getting an abnormal test, going back to the provider for uh, an exam called a colposcopy, getting a biopsy, and getting treatment, if, uh, depending on the diagnosis. But what this doesn't, this number of 330,000 doesn't tell you is that a lot of those women then come back six months later, 12 months later, 18 months later, a year, two years, three years later, and still something's not quite right, and they have to undergo another colposcopy and possibly another biopsy with side effects, pain, cost, time away from work, bleeding. And so um, it, it's almost a revolving door for some of these women. And in addition to that, there's a million new cases of genital warts and one and a half million new cases of a lower grade uh, abnormal pap that doesn't really need to be treated, but a lot of providers do over-treat or, or at least keep an eye on these women and bring them back more frequently. And so the cancer burden doesn't tell the whole story. There's actually millions of people who are affected by HPV-related disease every year at a cost of $7 billion a year in the U.S. just for cervical, not including the other types of, of cancers. Um, and, and uh, genital warts that HPV causes. So that's why it's so important to be vaccinated against HPV, to prevent all of this from happening. So there are some providers and some public health officials who say, well, what's the big deal about HPV? You'll just go get screened. But hopefully I've, I've just explained why, you know, screening isn't everything, and who wants to go through all of that even though for most people it will prevent, uh, at least for cervical cancer. But we now have a vaccine that's been available since 2006, so about 10 years. It's recommended for both females and males. 
uh, they can start getting vaccinated as early as age 9, but the recommendation is at ages 11 and 12. There are three shots that should be given, and uh, we would like these to be completed by the 13th birthday. If that's not possible, then uh, the vaccine is recommended up to age 26 in girls, 21 in boys, and 26 in men who have sex with men. There's a new vaccine that was approved by the FDA and recommended by the ACIP, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practice. Uh, called Gardasil 9. And so the earlier vaccines are uh, protected against the two types of HPV that cause the majority of cancer. They cause 70% of cervical cancers and even a larger percent of some of, the, some of the other HPV cancers. So when I hear the complaint or, or uh, myth, well, the vaccine only prevents two types of HPV, and there's 100 types. Well, that's true, but those two types cause 70% of cervical cancer. The new 9-valent, or Gardasil 9, protects against an extra five types, so now the protection is up to 90% of cervical cancer. And then type 6 and 11 cause between 90 and 99% of general awards. So the ACIP makes recommendations for all vaccines, and for HPV vaccine, they recommend routine vaccination at 11-12. I mentioned the catch-up for those who missed their vaccination at the recommended age. Um, and the, uh, the vaccine that only has the two types is from uh, GSK, GlaxoSmithKline. Um, less than 1% of the market in the U.S., although it is used in other countries around the world. In the U.S., we've been using Gardasil, which is now might be referred to as Gardasil 4, the four types, uh, for both males and females. And now we're in a transition year to the 9-valent. And the 4-valent Gardasil 4 will, will be phased out as the 9-valent Gardasil 9 replaces it. What's most important, if you can remember one slide through my entire talk, it's that the vaccine is safe, it's effective, it works, and it lasts. So we have tons of safety data. There have been almost 200 million doses of vaccine distributed around the world. So if you're concerned that a rare side effect would not have been detected in the tens of thousands of people that were studied in the various clinical trials. I hope that you'll be reassured that a one in a million rare side effect would have been detected now that over 200 million doses have been distributed. But there are ongoing safety studies, and any time a new question about safety comes up, a study is done. So a new study was just announced last month to look at two rare diseases or syndromes that some people think might be associated with HPV vaccine. We have no data to suggest that more girls who get the vaccine get either one of these syndromes than girls who do or do not get the vaccine, but the study is still being uh, developed and, and implemented. This is one of the safest vaccines, if not the safest vaccines there is is at least as safe as every other vaccine that we offer. The vaccine works, and I'll show you a little bit of data from other countries as well as the U.S. to show how we know this, and we also know that it is long-lasting. So safety. When the ACIP and provider groups and the American Cancer Society think about and consider whether to uh, recommend a vaccine or similar to screening, we look at the two sides. We look at the positive and the negative. On the positive, does the vaccine work? And on the negative, we make sure that there's no harm being done. Is it safe? And so this is the main system. There's the uh, vaccine adverse event 
registry system. This is the main system within the U.S. that we use to monitor vaccine safety. There are similar systems throughout Europe, Australia, and through the WHO, the World Health Organization. These are ongoing safety monitoring that uh, it, it's voluntary. So any provider or parent or teenager can submit a report that says, I experienced this side effect this many days, months after getting this vaccine. And of all of these uh, reports, 7.6% were coded as serious as opposed to non-serious. And the most frequent serious reports were headache, nausea, vomiting, and fever. We're not talking about people dropping dead from the vaccine. When you do see a headline, and I have seen some, that say so-and-so, this girl, for example, in Spain a few years ago, did die after getting an HPV vaccine within hours. And that made the front page of the newspapers. Three days later, not on the front page, but buried in the middle somewhere, explain that when they did an autopsy, they found a huge abdominal mass in that girl. So these, any rare reported deaths are followed up uh, and uh, look at all the records and make sure that they can confirm what happened. And there has never been a link between HPV vaccine and a death. Fainting is a concern for any teenager getting a vaccine, and so there is a warning, a recommendation to providers to observe uh, teenagers for 15 minutes uh, before letting them leave the office, just in case they faint and hit their head. And let me tell you that some of these reports of fainting were, for example, when kids were lined up, especially in other countries where they give vaccines in school, and some kid online saw somebody else getting vaccinated and fainted. They didn't even faint from getting the vaccine just from seeing the needle. I'm not trying to minimize, um, but so we do have fainting as a more common serious um, event and we have taken steps to, um, to minimize any harm from that. This slide shows that the number of serious and non-serious uh, adverse events reported over the years has gone steadily down. Uh, reports tend to be very common when a vaccine is new and everybody's sort of on the alert for, oh, I have this symptom, could this be from the vaccine? The new Gardasil 9, we haven't had um, as much experience with because we don't, it's brand new. We don't have millions and hundreds of millions of people getting this vaccine, but it is uh, pretty much the same as the uh, four-valent vaccine in terms of how it's prepared, um, and the safety profile uh, looks the same. The only difference is that the swelling and redness at the injection site is more common than the uh, older Gordisil 4. So let's turn now to what's the impact of this vaccine. And when somebody gets an HPV infection, usually it goes away. The immune system uh, resolves it. Sometimes it leads to genital warts. Sometimes uh, a simple uh, test or vaginal uh, cervical swab can tell you if there's HPV present. And that can happen very quickly after infection. If the HPV persists in the cervix, it can cause changes in the cervix, such as the precancers that I mentioned before, and this usually takes several years to happen. And then if that persistent infection and change in the cervix is going to then progress to cancer, that usually takes 15 to 20 years. So we will not see cervical cancer, anal cancer, oral cancer rate drop only 10 years since the vaccine has first been introduced. It's going to take another 10 plus years to see that. But these precancers are a proven uh, way to measure the impact of either screening vaccine or some other preventive intervention. So what we have so far is we have um, 
we have the impact on genital warts, and I'll show you um, some data from Australia where 70 plus percent of kids get vaccinated. But we have several countries where we've seen a huge decrease in genital warts. We see uh, a, a big decrease in the prevalence of HPV infections uh, in several countries. And we're starting to see a decrease in abnormal pap tests in several countries as well, including the US, even though we don't vaccinate nearly as many kids as these other countries. So here's an example from the US. This is prevalence of the HPV in Gardasil 4, the four types. And if you look at 14 to 19 year old, uh, I think this is just girls, so yeah, cervical vaginal swabs, there's over a 50% decrease between the three years before the vaccine was introduced and the three years, four years after. And this is even, this is with very low penetration of the vaccine, a 56% decrease. We're not seeing this in the uh, older, uh, the young women and older mid-adult and older women because those women were not vaccinated or they were vaccinated late in the teen years. And here is Australia. If you look on the left panel at the blue solid line, this is girls before the age of 21, and there has been about a 90% decline in genital warts. Genital warts has virtually been wiped out of Australia because girls are vaccinated. And this data only goes up to 2011, just before the vaccines for boys was introduced in Australia. And if you look at the panel on the right at the blue line, similarly, genital warts has decreased over 80% in boys just because the girls were vaccinated. Now in Australia, likely US boys are vaccinated as well. I mentioned that the vaccine lasts. So the vaccine was introduced about 10 years ago. It was studied in clinical trials for several years before that, including in all of the Scandinavian countries where they keep excellent registries. And we have seen no suggestion that the immunity is going to wear off. We also have excellent modeling studies showing that immunity should last at least 30 years. So there's no reason to think that we're going to need a booster shot, but there are multiple studies that are ongoing to monitor this just in case. And if we do see uh, that immunity starts to decrease after a certain number of years, then we'll recommend a booster at that time. So now let's talk about how many people are actually getting this vaccine. In Australia, I mentioned over 70%. In the United Kingdom, this slides is over 60%. I've seen other slides that I think it's in, the, in England that's above 80%. But yet in the United States, only a third of girls get all three doses of the vaccine and a little more than half get just the first dose. And the numbers are much lower for boys. So the top two lines on this graph are the other two vaccines, Tdap and meningococcal, that are given at age 11, 12. And 80, 90 percent of uh, boys and girls are getting those vaccines, but yet a much lower number percent of girls and boys are getting uh, the first dose of HPV and an even lower number are getting all three. So these kids are in the doctor's office getting other vaccines. They are not, you know, the, the children of parents who say, absolutely not, I have a problem with any vaccine, I'm not going to do it. These are kids getting the other vaccines at the correct age. And uh, this little notation is that the, uh, the methodology was modified slightly um, in the last year to be a little bit more inclusive. Um, and I think it was in 2012 that they started including a cell phone um, randomized uh, digit dialing in addition to landline phones to reach um, more uh, people to answer this survey. So if every girl who goes to the doctor's office at age 11, 12, 13 and gets the other two vaccines also got HPV 
we would have 91% coverage for at least the first dose. That is what's achievable. And in fact, in Rhode Island, we have about 75% uh, coverage. In Philadelphia, we have over 80%. So it is doable. So what's the problem? Why isn't this happening and what, what can we do about it? The main thing we can do is help doctors talk about the HPV vaccine in a more effective way. If you ask parents of 11 and 12 year old kids to rank on a scale of 1 to 10 their value of the different vaccines available to their children at that age. Across the board, they rank all of the vaccines somewhere between a 9 and a 10. If you then go to pediatricians and you ask them, how do you think parents, your patient's parents, rank these vaccines, they agree on all, a little bit lower on flu, but for some reason, pediatricians think that parents only rank HPV as a 5 compared to a 9 plus on every other vaccine. So there's a big discrepancy in perception here that we need to fix. Here are the top five reasons in various surveys that parents say, I don't intend or haven't vaccinated my child. Uh, the, the answers are the same but in slightly different order for boys and girls. Not recommended by the provider is the most important reason. And if you look at these other reasons, if a parent doesn't want to vaccinate their child because they're not sexually active, but the provider recommends it, and the parent says, well, no, I'm not going to do this, or I'm not going to do it today, there's an opportunity for the provider to say, well, what's your concern? Why not? Do you have any questions? And if they say, well, my child's not sexually active, the provider can then say, but we need to vaccinate your child before they're sexually active. Just like we need to vaccinate against tetanus before they step on a rusty nail. We need to vaccinate against measles before they go off to Disneyland and get exposed. If they're concerned about safety, then the provider can start explaining, hopefully briefly, you know, but we have tons of data showing just how safe this is. Did you hear something? And, oh, I heard that rumor too, but here's what the studies really show. So all of these other reasons disappear if the provider gives a strong recommendation and addresses any concerns that the parent has. And CDC has shown that this conversation can happen in 45 seconds or less. One of the problems we've found is that providers are ending, ending up spending 5, 10 minutes going into these long explanations when all they need to say is, you know, oh, yes, we have tons of safety data. And that, that, that can be enough. So a strong recommendation from the provider is the main reason parents will decide to vaccinate and most moms who are the ones who make most of these decisions for their kids do trust uh, the provider when they make a recommendation. So what we want is for providers to make a recommendation for HPV in the same way and on the same day as Tdep and meningococcal. Not to say, your child's going to get two vaccines today and, oh, there's this third one if you're interested. You would never hear a pediatrician say, oh, your baby is due for measles, mumps, and rubella, and oh, you could get polio too if you'd like, but if not, we can wait. So CDC has provided tons of quick messages for any question the parent might have and, any, and, and for the approach that clinicians can take. Your child is due for three vaccines. It will help prevent meningitis, cancer, and pertussis. And we've, uh, there are studies that show that mentioning HPV first or second is more effective than putting it third. And then, as I mentioned, whatever question the parent might ask, why does my child need this vaccine, CDC has information to answer it because it prevents cancer. Uh, why now? Why can't we wait? Because the immune response is better. 
It's also true that it's before, hopefully before the child becomes sexually active. There's really no reason to get into a conversation about sex, which a lot of providers are uncomfortable with and a lot of parents don't want to hear or hear in front of their children. But we do have a talking points if that topic is raised as well. And finally, there are evidence-based strategies to increase HPV vaccination and other vaccine coverage. And these include reminder and recall, both from the provider level, such as pop-ups on their electronic uh, medical records, and sending postcards, calls, or text messaging to parents. Standing orders, provider assessment and feedback, such as the ASIC system, um, and utilizing immunization information systems. And that's my last slide, I can hand over for the next talk. Thank you, Debbie. And now, Megan McKinney. I was still muted there. This is Megan. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, we can see it. All right, great. Um, thanks for the introduction. I'm Megan McCann. I'm a project coordinator at the American Indian Cancer Foundation, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the HPV vaccine specifically for um, in American American Indian communities and with American Indian parents. So the objectives for um, my presentation are to describe the basic HPV cancer burden for American Indians and how the HPV vaccine can help end cancer disparities, identify differences in parental attitudes towards the HPV vaccine for American Indians compared to the general population, understand how to access culturally appropriate educational materials on the HPV vaccine, and to identify future needs for HPV vaccine research, clinical data, and outreach. So at, I work at the American Indian Cancer Foundation, and just to give a brief background about um, the organization, we're a national nonprofit organization, and our mission is to reduce or end the cancer burden for American Indian communities and families throughout the country. And our vision is a world where cancer is no longer a leading cause of death for American Indian and Alaska Natives. Uh, we go about our work in a variety of ways, prevention, screening, early detection, um, and the HPV work we do is part of our immunizations for cancer prevention work. So I greatly appreciate the extensive um, background that Debbie gave on HPV and the and the burden of, uh, of HPV cancers. Um, to just briefly review, HPV is a common infection that most people come in contact with um, sometime in their life. Both men and women are susceptible to HPV cancers. And um, American Indians face significant disparities for some HPV cancers. Um, as with most health indicators for American Indians, the um, health outcomes vary by region, and HPV cancers are no different. Um, the Northern Plains, which is where I'm located and where our organization is headquartered in Minneapolis, has especially high incidence and mortality for HPV cancers, um, especially cervical cancer. So Northern Plains American Indian women are four times more likely to get and die from cervical cancer. And American Indians in Minnesota, which again is part of the Northern Plains region, are twice as likely to get throat cancers, um, of which is with the most common HPV cancer for men. So Again, to reiterate Debbie's point that HPV is a big deal and it is a very big deal in American Indian communities, because, especially because of these very high disparities. But the good news is, which Debbie went into great detail about, there is a vaccine available that can pr protect against the types of HPV that cause 70% of these cancers. And now with the Gardasil 9, that is going up to 90%, so it's um, even more exciting how um, how effective this vaccine can be um, for preventing those cancers. And other great news is that actually American Indians 
are using the HPV vaccine at higher rates than any other group. Um, American Indian children are guaranteed the are guaranteed vaccines, including the HPV vaccine, at no at um, at no cost, regardless of their income background, through the Vaccines for Children program. Um, so it's really great that they are using it at higher rates. So compared to non-Hispanic whites, um, this data is from 2014, the, the teen vaccine survey, and so this is for coverage of 13 to 17 year olds. And so um, for non-Hispanic whites, it's they are the the lowest they have the lowest coverage of um, ethnic and racial groups, and so girls, 56% for the first dose, and boys, 36 compared to American Indians, where that is 71% of girls are getting the first dose and 50% of boys are getting the first dose. Um, again, this, this varies regionally, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but the only region that has a large enough sample size of American Indians um, is Alaska, where they are actually showing 80% coverage for the HPV vaccine, so that's very encouraging news. However, the not-so-great news is that the HPV vaccine still has less uptake than the other routinely recommended adolescent vaccines and that boys still have drastically lower uptake. So at the American Indian Cancer Foundation, we um, you know, put, put thought into what types of strategies can be taken to increase these rates and that even though American Indians may be using it at using the vaccine at higher rates than other groups. That um, targeted strategies are still important, um, as with any um, as with any health issue. And so, what strategies can be taken to really help increase vaccination rates in in these communities? So there are um, a very few culturally specific resources available about the HPV vaccine, and there's also very limited knowledge and published, published research on why American Indians, um, American Indian parents choose whether to vaccinate their children. So um, organization held focus groups in the Twin Cities with parents of American Indian adolescents age 7 to 12 to gain input into what types of educational materials um, they would like to see to help them make um, make a choice about whether to vaccinate their children. And so findings from those groups led to the development of some culturally appropriate materials which are in your resource packet and I will share in a few minutes. So the goals of our focus groups were to identify what are the knowledge gaps about the HPV vaccination and what are the best ways to address those gaps. What are parents' attitudes and beliefs towards the vac HPV vaccination? What are other barriers, other potential barriers, that are preventing parents from vaccinating their children for HPV? And how can HPV educational materials be improved for American Indians? So we had seven focus groups with uh, 39 total part uh, participants, and we, they were held in the Twin Cities. Um, so all of the participants were lived in the urban area. Um, 82, we welcomed grandparents if they were the primary guardians, but the majority were parents. and um, we had almost all women who came, so echoing Debbie's point that it's all, often, often the moms who are making these decisions. Um, one thing that we were very excited about about this input is that the people who came and shared their opinions with us were split evenly between parents of boys and girls. So a lot of the you know knowledge that does exist about parental attitudes about the vaccine come from parents of girls or from adolescent girls themselves, and there's a lot less out there about boys, so that was exciting about this project. So we gave participants a brief survey at the beginning of the focus group, and even though it was a very small group, and this is certainly not a statistically significant sample, um, we still th thought that some of the results from this were very interesting in the direction that they trend. So we asked participants, I understand what HPV is, and for that, 61% um, agreed, and that would be agree or strongly disagree, or agree or strongly agree. Um, and then the next question, I understand what the vaccine is, that drops down to about half. And then 
finally, I have enough information to decide whether to vaccinate my child. Only about one third of parents agreed. So again, you know, reinforcing the idea that there is not enough information available for parents to make the choice for their children. Another thing that was very interesting from the survey was we asked belief um, questions about the parents' beliefs about the vaccine. And so, you know, again, these statements, the HPV vaccine prevents cancer. So this was on a, a four-point Likert scale of strongly disagree, disagree, agree, strongly agree. And 65% either strongly agreed or agreed with the um, positive statements, but for the negative statements or for the disagree statements, we had about you know a third for each of them that agreed that that felt had the negative belief about the statement, whether it's you know the HPV vaccine will help my child stay healthy or that it prevents cancer. However, we had zero percent of participants strongly disagree with the positive statements and zero percent strongly agree with the negative statements, which we thought was significant because um, it shows that perhaps the, the thread of extreme anti-vaccination um, attitudes is not as common in this population compared to the general population where there would certainly be, um, there's evidence that there's more, there are more people who have strongly um, negative beliefs about vaccination. Another interest, the final interesting thing I'll share about the what we learned from our short survey is that half of the people who participated in our um, in our focus groups were taking their children to a clinic that is not American Indian specific, and we thought this was important because oftentimes. Um, targeted messaging or interventions designed, designed for American Indians or American Indian parents or children um, take place at, at um, organizations that primarily serve American Indian families. For example, in the Twin Cities, we have the Native American Community Clinic, but we found that half of our participants were not going there, so it's always important to keep that in mind that you're not, um, you're not only going to um, that interventions at Native American specific places are not the only places that you'll be able to reach this population. Um, we asked where people had heard about the HP vaccine. One out of five had never heard of it. And the second um, highest place where they had, had heard of it is from a doctor, again, showing the importance of providers in recommending the vaccine to parents. What we found about attitudes on the HPV vaccine is that number one, people needed more, thought that there was a need for more knowledge and awareness about the vaccine. There was significant confusion about what the vaccine prevents and who should get the vaccine. For example, even among parents who were aware that the vaccine was recommended for boys, many felt that it was only recommended for boys because um, they could be carriers of the vaccine and transfer it to women later in life and not, were unaware of the fact that men and um, that males could get HPV related cancers. Another prominent theme was that current HPV messaging does not appeal to American Indians. So we had them react to some um, other materials that were already published for the general population um, on the HPV vaccine. And in particular, I'll, t I'll talk a little bit Oh, well, I guess it is here. So in particular, messages that alluded to um, HPV being an STD, for example, there's one that says, you know, you're not opening the door to sex, you're closing the door to cancer. People did not like that message. They thought it was strange. They would say, what does sex have to do with cancer? Um, so that was pretty, pretty much across the board a disliked message and that the, any message that was about cancer prevention and protecting children should be the central message. I know that most organizations are already um, either beginning to or have um, started to move much further towards this type of messaging for the general population as well. And then also that the influences to vaccinate are varied. So some, the number one um, influence for their decision to vaccinate their children was community, which could include family members, elders, or um, peers. 
um, the the fact that if whether or not it was normative or required was a, was a significant influencer. Many people said that it was the parents' decision ultimately, and then others said that doctors were an important influence. Other findings were that a lot of parents were very concerned with safety and talked about needing to you know weigh the pros and cons. And some of the cons um, were fears of that that the vaccine that they could be being experimented on, a mistrust of the the medical field, both doctors, the government, um, and this is because of the the long history of um, negative experiences for American Indians with the medical community. Um, on the on the other hand, there was also a significant fear of infectious disease and positive attitudes about vaccines. And many of our participants placed this in a historical context um, or, his, or discussed historical trauma that American Indians have had a um, uniquely traumatizing relationship with infectious disease in the, history of the, in the history of the United States and that vaccines are seen as a very positive thing to um, that their children will be able to avoid infectious disease in a way that their ancestors were unable to do so. So really the these focus groups revealed that there there is a is a need for specific messaging for American Indians um, that they they looked at some of the the images that already existed and said well I would walk right by this this, this doesn't speak to me I don't um, I wouldn't look twice at this and that um, it was important to them that there was culturally appropriate education materials for them um, when having conversations with American Indian parents it is important for providers to always keep in mind that there is this um, history of mistrust with the medical community and that that shouldn't mean that you should shy away from potentially difficult conversations, um, but to, to acknowledge that and to be aware of that as, as um, you go into a conversation. Also, of, of all of our focus groups, we had zero parents who were concerned about HPV um, back, the HPV vaccine leading to early sexual initiation, zero, no one, and when we prompted them and asked them um, about that concern, they were incredulous that, many were incredulous that anyone could even have that opinion, um, and we, this was a significant finding, again, considering the, the research that has been done showing that that is um, a concern among many in the general population, especially whites. And also in our focus group in particular, we found that convenience and cost were not mentioned as significant barriers. Um, again, this was a small, it was a small sample, so uh, we, um, and we may have reached a, an insured population or perhaps it's because of the, the vaccine being provided at no cost for American Indian children, um, but it was not notable that those were not um, brought up by participants as being significant barriers to vaccination. So kind of to finish off, I'll share with you what we did develop from those focus groups and these are available. Um, we are disseminating them now. So if you are interested in using these in your practice, um, we have them available to print off. We are also able um, to mail them for um, mail them to interested clinics who might be interested in putting them in their waiting room. And you can get in touch with me about that directly. My contact information was on the first slide. But first we have this fact sheet, which was um, designed, basically these questions were the most common questions that um, parents had. And you'll see a lot of similarities with um, other fact sheets from the CDC, for example. Um, but there are, it is also um, really just verbatim the questions that they had most common. So, that is the first material that we developed. We also have a poster um, that is of an American Indian boy from Minnesota playing basketball. Parents thought that uh, having an active child looking healthy was the type of messaging they would see. We found it interesting that now actually the CDC has new, um, newish educational materials on the vaccine for boys and that they took a very similar approach. They have a boy um, jumping off a dock into a, into a lake and so we thought we feel like that's good that that's kind of the direction that parents are hoping to see the messaging go 
And then last, we have this infographic, which um, just, again, kind of goes over some basic information promoting the vaccine. And what we, uh, one important point that we wanted to really emphasize in this infographic is that males can also get HPV-related cancers. I believe this is my last slide, and just thinking about the future needs for increasing HPV vaccination among American Indians. Um, first, you know, edu these education materials were developed with input from urban American Indians in the Northern Plains, and so the, these findings may not apply to other regions. Um, these focus groups can be replicated in other parts of the country. If there's people who are interested in doing that in their communities, we can certainly share you know, our focus group guide and uh, would be happy to chat with anyone about that. And that, and also these, um, the current materials are going to be tested in a new quantitative study coming up, um, but they, but more studies like that are needed in the future. Another issue is that data about HPV vaccine coverage is very spotty for American Indians. Even the, um, the data that I went over earlier comes from uh, quite a small sample. It is a sig statistically significant sample, the, the CDC numbers, but has quite a wide um, confidence interval and um, more data is needed. The only region that has specific data available is Alaska and that that information is really needed to be able to tell the full story and to help guide future interventions. And of course, providers play a hugely important role in increasing vaccination rates. As Again, to reiterate what Debbie said, um, a provider recommendation is the number one reason that parents are choosing to va vaccinate their children. And um, more provider education programs are needed to help close that gap of parents' perception of the importance of the vaccine and pri providers' perception of the importance of the vaccine. Um, and so that's another step in helping continuing to increase the rates. So that is what I have and I guess we will I'll hand it back over to Josh for the question session. Okay. Thank you, Megan. Yep. Um, so far we have two questions which ask uh, the same thing. And that is why is the cutoff age for the vaccine different for boys or girls and boys at twenty six and twenty one respectively? So I can answer that, it's Debbie. Um, first of all, the American Cancer Society um, has different recommendations um, because we, what I presented was uh, the ACIP and all the provider groups. Uh, we recognize and, and look more closely at the data and, and the, the important thing is that the recommendation is for 11 to 12. That's the strongest recommendation. After age 15, uh, the effectiveness starts to go down for two reasons. One is the immune response is not as great. And two is more kids are starting to have sex by that age. So uh, the, the recommendations for girls and boys or men and women were made at different times. When the vaccine first came out, we only had clinical trial data on females. And then it was three years later that it was considered for males and a different process was used. Um, and when the recommendation was first made for males, there was a lot of consideration about cost effectiveness and something called herd immunity, which is what I showed in Australia, that if you just vaccinate girls, boys will also be protected. Um, and so slightly different criteria were used three years later for males. And, um, and I guess nobody wanted to backtrack and change the female recommendation. Thank you. So, so it has nothing to do with safety. Um, that's all the questions we have so far. I'll wait um, another 30 seconds or so to see if any more show up.
seeing any more questions. Um, there's a thank you. Oh, can we have access to the information on your slides, particularly the statistical data? Is the statistical data you provide available anywhere? Or mine, mine is, and the citation for any data that I provided was is on the is on the slide. So you should be able to find that. And I, I know that the the vaccine coverage data that I shared, um, in particular, the most recent 2014 data just came out, I want to say, a month ago. So that's pretty new, and they have the full, you know, you can PDF spreadsheet or Excel spreadsheet even that you can download on the CDC's MMWR website. So you should be able to find that through my... Um, citation, this is Megan, and if not, you're always welcome to contact me. I would be happy to share that with you, too, if you're unable to find what you're looking for. Thank you. And as I would also mention, too, just as far as information and data about the effectiveness of the vaccine, the CDC um, has does a pretty good job on their website about um, providing data on that. So exploring their website is, they have a lot of information on there, but when you find it, it's, it's good. All right. Thank you for... Um, thank you for attending the National Native Network Technical Assistance Webinar. Please watch for the evaluation survey, which will come to you by email shortly. If you're planning to obtain CEUs for this webinar, complete the evaluation survey in its entirety. Please visit our website, www.keepitsacred.org, to find this and other technical assistance webinars, as well as many other cancer and commercial tobacco prevention resources for tribes and tribal organizations. So, I'd like to thank everyone again. Um, I'll leave leave the webinar up for a little bit after we end it so that if you're in the middle of downloading handouts or anything, I won't interrupt that. <laughs>